We're going to get started. Welcome everybody. My name is Sara Gomez and I'm the Assistant Director of the Environmental Studies Program at Tufts University. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the last Ho Cunningham Environmental Lecture of the semester, which is made possible thanks to the great generosity of Tufts alumni, Daphne Ho Cunningham and Roland Hoke. And we are done for the semester, so this is the last one, but if you would like to see alerts from about the exciting lineup we have for next semester, uh, you can do so in the link will be posted in the chat. And also the same for if you want to subscribe to our student news newsletter, we'll also put that link there. But again, I think we're sending the last one on Monday, so you will not receive them until next semester. A few housekeeping items. As usual, the chat is disabled. So if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A box or you can raise your hand, your digital hand at the end of the presentation. The meeting is being recorded and you will be able to access it in our website in a, in a week or two. Or if you need it before that, you can always send me an email and I'll be happy to share the link before that. All right, so I'm really excited about finishing the semester with today's talk to have, it, uh, to have an artist because um, the intersection of art and the environment is something we are really uh, we really like to think about in the environmental studies program. And this is something you will probably notice if you have ever walked the halls of Barnum where our office is located. So we have a lot of pictures, lots of paintings. If you haven't done so, I'd recommend you to, to check it out. We just installed something right before COVID happened. And we also have a few other things in the pipeline which we'll be talking more about uh, in, in next semester. And actually we are offering a new uh, class uh, in the intersection of art and the environment. It's called the, uh, the Art of Making an Environmental Impact taught by Lee Brown, who gave a, a Hope Cunningham lecture a few weeks ago. And uh, there are a couple of seats open in the class and I know they won't last long. So if you're a student interested in this uh, topic, I uh, recommend you to, to take a look at that class. And now I'm really honored to introduce today's speaker, Olivia Ann Carrie Holstein. Olivia is not only an, uh, an amazing artist and an educator, she's also an SMFA alum and a former student of mine. So <laughs> it's very exciting to have her here. We reconnected about a year ago. We ran into each other at the SMFA. And because actually Olivia has been, uh, has remained connected uh, to the school. She's now in the sustainability committee at the SMFA. And she's a finalist for the Green Fund. So she's working to launch a certification for sustainable art. And if you're interested in seeing uh, her presentation, the presentations are tonight. And the, I think the winner will be announced next week. So all our, our luck for, for Olivia. Um, Olivia's work focuses on multi-sensory experiences and sustainable artistic practices. And she's the co-founder of the Joe Leaf Co Collaborative with musician Jonas Kublikas. If you want to know more about her art, we'll be posting a link to her website so you can explore after the talk. And also about her career, she actually started in Europe. She started in artist collective and theaters in Berlin where she studied set and costume design and where she founded a community oriented arts organization called IMPI. And she later moved to Cambridge where she went to the, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts here at TAPS. And her work has been uh, exhibited internationally numerous times, including in the, at the MFA in Boston. And today she's gonna be telling uh, us a little bit more about what her pra practice is about. And I can't wait to hear it. So thank you, Olivia, for being with us today. And uh, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Coco. I'm so excited to be here. And again, my name is Olivia Ann Carey Holstein, and I'm going to discuss my work in relation to sustainable practices and community in this lecture, Make the World You Want to See. So I want to use examples from my own experience to discuss the possibilities of sustainability and community building through adaptation. I'm here to encourage each of you to begin to develop your own practices with these points in mind. Again, in my practice, I focus on the following, sustainable artistic and culinary practices and multisensorial awareness promoting curations. So why choose sustainable practices at all? Well, 
there are a huge number of reasons, whether you are passionate about changing deforestation or factory farming practices, or want to keep the ice caps on the planet that reflect the extra heat from the sun and keep our planet's temperatures stable, or if you recognize how many climate refugees there are already and will be in the future, or are overwhelmed by the incredible piles of waste and landfills that produce methane gas, or even if you are looking for a way to stop throwing so much stuff away and making real use out of what you have, sustainable practices are the solution. That means that you are actively trying to find new approaches to these systems that perpetuate this horrible cycle of devastation, unhealthy conditions, and toxicity. So throughout this process, I ask myself, um, sorry, I ask myself the following four questions. What, why, goals, and how? I will explain the details of this in the following slides. Under what, I have observation and reflection, which is the best starting point for any practice, whether artistic, scientific, or activistic. The first step is identifying and reflecting on your surroundings to build upon them constructively. Under why, I have community, accountability, and responsiveness. Without these aspects, it is impossible to have a thriving environment since degradation is a human issue. Under goals, I've put resilience and growth. Sometimes these elements can take on different, not so obvious forms and they require an open-mindedness to see them in action. Under how, I have three key principles in sustainable practices, adaptability, minimizing waste, and choosing necessity, not greed. Um, under goals, no, under how, I have, no, <laughs> In order to sustain a practice, sorry about this, these are key elements. I chose the above mural that I made in my former apartment for the following reasons. One head is listening and reflecting intently. The next is looking at the world with open eyes, and the last head expresses what it has listened to, reflected upon, observed, and considered. And the cycle continues in the circle of three. The voice of expression informs the next reflection for consideration that creates the next expression, etc. I also included the shelves I built that hang in front of this mural because they're a nice symbol for the questions below that act as the pantry supplies for a sustainable practice. So before we start digging into details of my own work, let's quickly touch upon a very large and important question. What can art teach us? Often, art is dismissed as a cultural phenomenon that is separate from actual innovation, but the opposite is true. Take these two examples into account. This drawing by Lazo Maholinaj is a theoretical architectural sketch that largely informed a constructivist aesthetic that puts geometry and form first. And this focus has led to the very aesthetic that this slide structure I am using here has, a diamond within a diamond that separates two almost square images. These clear lines and geometry have become so intertwined in how we present the world and our ideas, and often it is forgotten that this was an innovation in visual form that has changed how people see the world. The second image shows a dyed ecat shawl that Frida Kahlo wore from the southern region of Mexico called Oaxaca, which I will bring up several times in this lecture. The pattern is naturally dyed and woven in a traditional way that dates thousands of years, but has often been excluded from art history and called natural history or craft, though it was made by incredible creators who have dedicated their lives to these practices. These two images show an intersection between long-standing traditions and visual movements that inform the present discussion on what sustainability and sustainable practices can be. Now, living in tune with the environment and as part of a close-knit community is not a new or contemporary idea at all. In fact, much of the world lives exactly this way. This is Juana Gutierrez, whom I had the incredible opportunity to study under at her home in Teotitlan de Valle in Oaxaca, Mexico last November. She developed 200 colors out of the materials that she could find in her region where for thousands of years, there were about 20 that were commonly used. Her family is fighting to keep natural dye traditions alive in the Zapotec legacy, while simultaneously innovating and taking inspiration from international artists to create their weavings. Collectively, herself, her husband Antonio, and her brother Porfirio balance the knowledge of a history that was almost abolished and bring those traditions into present conversations 
of artistry. In my own research, I study natural dyes and practices related to these thousands of years of traditions. Where does color come from? How did color evolve? What is safe to use? How can we protect artists' self-sufficiency as much of this knowledge is replaced by convenience? I do this by studying natural dyes, inks, and pigments, and trying things out at home. In my artistic practice, I try to break the reality of the day-to-day -day by developing sensory experiences that create the opportunity for greater depth. More on this soon. In order to do this, it starts with observation. So can anyone see the perspective change in the symbol of the Brandenburg Gate? Once you see it, you will not be able to unsee it. So, right, it is at the bottom of the fifth pillar. I like to think that this was done on purpose as a kind of inside joke for anyone who pays attention. And a lot of inspiration is like that. If you pay attention, you will not be able to unsee the kinds of things you begin to notice. Once you observe how you can make constructive change, you start to see those opportunities everywhere. Now the drawing on the right of your screen is my drawing of the sound of an egg frying. Three and a half years ago, I started drawing the sounds I heard around me, and I took it far enough to actually develop a methodology for describing sound visually that I applied to painting music and soon to, des to describing tastes and flavors. But recently, I have gone back to the roots of observation. One result of quarantining for me has been a greater awareness and pure awe for the natural environment. This spring, I even had the opportunity to be taught a cardinal bird song from the cardinal himself. As a result, I have been painting flowers. I never expected to be painting flowers, but it has brought me to consider where and when people exchange bouquets. I've realized that bouquets of flowers are often exchanged as a celebration of life whether to show appreciation or love or to celebrate a person's life who has passed, something too many of us have been confronted with in these past months. But flowers and still lives are a pinnacle aspect of art history Where, of, and any painting practice, any major aesthetic movement begins with the observational studies and grows to express all kinds of opinions, whether you are Georgia O'Keeffe who expresses sensuality and femininity through depictions of flowers, or if you are Cezanne painting endless still lives while developing a style that inspired modernism and impressionism in France and Western Europe, and eventually much of the world. These studies and observation inevitably lead to reflections on those observations. For example, in a recent article I wrote called On the Social and Sustainability and Art, I use this image here to reflect on the contrast between branding interests and the independent creator. The Coca-Cola truck embodies for me the cult of sameness, where the goal is to achieve the same result every time, whereas the graffiti down here shows, um, shows expressive individualism, where the uniqueness of the expressor and the public is celebrated. It is a call of it's a call and a protest in the face of this cult of sameness and things like natural dyes, which are largely uncontrollable, reflect those goals well. The other image is of an interactive poster I put in front of my studio in Neukölln in Berlin in 2015. I was in the midst of developing a series of works to help fight the gentrification in my neighborhood. And so I decided that the best way to reflect on what people in my neighborhood needed was to ask directly. Often, it is more important to listen longer than it is to speak. So this is where community comes in. No matter your location, you are not an isolated entity, though sometimes it may feel that way, especially when you are part of a university community or a work community or a neighborhood or an interest these communities and support groups are absolutely the most important things that need to thrive and be fostered. One way to foster community 
is to cook together. Like this image of the cake party I threw two years ago. Another way is to honor and reflect on the community you have by expressing who makes up that community. Like the second image of portraits I painted my senior year of high school. It is important to remember when trying to become more sustainable that there is a whole chain of people and environments that are affected by the actions you take. Recognizing that, I hope, can make us more respectful and thoughtful towards those people and environments. I truly believe that honoring community is a form of self-respect. Some ways to bring community together can revolve around artistic process. For example, a live exhibition or lecture can bring like-minded people into the same space or influence and build a new community of thinkers and observers. Another way is to educate one another on our passions. Like I do when I teach workshops on sustainable artistic practices, this image was taken at my workshop during Health, Safety and Sustainability Day at the SMFA last March called, How Many Fossils Are in Your Ink? and Other Answers About Art Materials. During that time, we explored several different, uh, different materials, how to make them ourselves, and how they are produced industrially. A lot of what goes into community building is accountability for those around us and the environment that surrounds us. I did this while running the community-oriented arts organization called IMPI by teaching upcycled puppetry workshops in local businesses. In this way, I was able to collaborate with entrepreneurs and neighbors to build a greater sense of community in the face of gentrification while giving people a fun way to interact with each other and express themselves while educating about upcycling practices. After all of this, there is a time to find space to respond. I was able to exhibit this piece um, performance piece on the right called Die Menschliche Marionette, or the human puppet in several spaces around Germany. It was a reflection on the power interactions between peoples, where I created a suit which suspend, suspended me in the air attached to ropes that the audience members could control. As a result, the viewer could control how I moved. I learned a lot about the relationship many people have with both vulnerability and power. Some people could not stand to be in the same room as my performance, while others encouraged their children to take the ropes. Now, while I was working as a set and costume designer in the state theaters in Berlin, I worked on a piece called Wer dich nicht findet, darf dich behalten, or Whoever Does Not Find You Can Keep You by Katja Brunner with uh, director Lucia Bila, who is now head director of the Volksbühne Berlin. This script was about the Fritzel story who kept his daughter in a secret apartment in his basement for over a decade and had several children by her during that time. The show was completely wordless and took place in a peep box that I designed, floating mid-air on the stage. All six actors and actresses did not leave this box for the entire show and were dressed in pale and pastel tones, which were simultaneously fresh looking like a child and the colors of bandages for healing. The actors and actresses did not take a bow at the end of the show. They simply continued to live on stage as the lights revealed their isolation in the small box. The fourth wall was not broken to symbolize how many stories of this kind continue. Art can act as a reflection of life and send important messages about what needs to be changed and paid attention to. Now, many would not consider bundle dying as an act of resilience, but this is exactly what I decided to do when the quarantine began. These dye materials that I had had frozen became an important project in a chaotic time. My mother has felt particularly vulnerable due to the pandemic, and this was a stabilizing opportunity in the face of anxiety, fear, and distress. I show this process as a reminder that art as resilience can often take the form of craft and is the practice, discipline, and consistency that allow for greater forms. Resilience usually does not look like a Hercules, strong, muscular, and defiant. Instead, resilience looks like finding the brightest colors in the darkest days and continuing step by step toward a greater future. This is what this moment symbolizes for me now. 
I take inspiration for resilience and the growth that follows this initial act through art from these artists. A wonderful example is Colectivo Chiquitaca, who following the devastating earthquakes in Yucatan, Oaxaca, Mexico, organized their community of artists um, to provide services for those affected and paint murals on the walls of the city, often of members of the community. Or Hildegard von Bing, a German Benedictine abbess, writer, composer, philosopher, Christian mystic, visionary, and polymath of the high Middle Ages from the region where I was born, who in the early thousands studied and reflected upon music, art, the sciences, and literature, she, despite discrimination, created an incredible basis of knowledge and thought and work at a time when women were not considered able to contribute. Or Delfina Munoz de Toros work on paper Vime Juve, Fruit of the Serpent, a serpent uh, which is a watercolor from 2019, who has dedicated her life to the promotion and visibilization of indigenous cultures in the Amazon especially. These are acts of art making that heal and contribute and take matters in their own hands to create constructive and creative environments. This quote from the Camden Art Center London's Botanical Mind exhibition that I reviewed for Eco Art Space last spring describes plant adaptability despite being sessile or being grounded to one place. The idea is that this staying in place actually allows for a large amount of complex and highly sophisticated relationships with environment. In a way, due to the quarantine, we are being sessile and having to adapt to our direct environments and grow according to quickly changing circumstances. Suddenly, we have a lot to learn from plants. Now, before the pandemic, my partner and I were in the midst of a loo of exhibitions and conferences revolving around a practice of multisensorial curations. We began with visual and musical harmonies like this one called Aquaman Sleeps, which I am dancing in front of in this first picture. Here's what it sounds like. starts to dance to the music during sustained concentration. This harmony is what we want to expand upon. And the next step is dinner harmonies, um, where taste, sound, and visual stimuli harmonize to become a kind of symphony for the senses, transporting the viewer to a heightened awareness of themselves, each other, and their surroundings. In other words, we are creating awe. These paintings act as visual harmonies to the music they are paired with and have a promising effect. At our exhibit, Comprovisations, last January, where Jonas Kublitskis and I showed our visual and musical pairings, visitors spent on average three minutes in front of each painting. Some spent over an hour enthralled by the static images and musical combinations. This is a huge difference in time spent, where many museums report an average of 15 to 20 seconds spent in front of each individual work. This goes to show that it does not necessarily take highly saturated videos with blaring, blaring audio and tons of movement to hold a person's attention. With the proper curation, people can be brought to being present and gain the space and concentration to develop their own experiences and opinions. Now this is us at a celebrity series party last fall. We've spent the greater part of 2019, 2020 developing logos and plans to found our collaborative. We also were married this October in a socially distant ceremony here in Cambridge. And I am most lucky to have found a really incredible husband, partner and love of my life. <laughs> 
So the five senses project of the Yo Live Collaborative produces multi-sensorial experiences that promote consciousness and connectivity in a growingly isolating world. Artist Olivia and Carrie Halstein pairs with musician Jonas Koblitzkis to study the effects of atmospheres driven by the experience of sound, taste, visual, touchable, felt and smellable sensations. Through acoustic vi virtual worlds, we focus on the experiential real and unlocking the potential to bridge the growing disparities between disciplines, environments, and peoples. Our work is an odyssey into the seemingly familiar, which traces the roots of abstractive arts and builds environments to contemplate not what is available in a 60 second YouTube video, but the relationship developed with one's environment as a meditation. So all of this was happening planned lectures and exhibitions and traveling ahead, then freeze, pandemic, lockdown, no gatherings and therefore no experiences, especially not anywhere people share headphones, let alone food. This required a complete turnaround on our plans for the Five Senses project. So like a plant being sessile at home, I created an internet presence, like sending out small signals through a network of roots. And I have been creating variations on five senses boxes that are sent directly to the viewer or experiencer at home, like a flower spreading pollen. <laughs> These boxes contain five or more objects that stimulate each of the senses. The first variation was interactive and meant for fellow artists who would experience the box reflect on it and then remake them and return them. The second variation is a series of objects and a set of directions. The boxes are custom YoLive Five Senses project boxes with touchable, smellables, tasteable, listenable, and visually stimulating objects. They have names like cleanly box or fresh box or start the darn day box. <laughs> All of these objects come together to create a fully sensing experience and a tactile connection that is increasingly hard to find. The third variation is forthcoming and will reflect on recreating experiences that are no longer available because of quarantine, like going to a coffee shop or creating experiences for shared empathy and growing awareness. Here's a short video on the work we did last year. a comprovisation. Remember those good old music visualizations on your first computer? The ones with all the colors that looked like they were dancing according to the music? That's a start. It's taking something that's a line and turns it into splashes of color and geometric shapes that are organized according to the music. audience kind of starts to see art but also the world around them in a different light to really spend the time with something not just to bridge breeze by it or you know swipe 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 instead to look at something and really 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 see it and hear what's around you instead of putting the the earphones in the second you walk outside there's an entire beautiful soundscape and every space that you're in
have developed methodology, but like Arthur Dove, <laughs> I have to listen to the music on repeat to kind of keep that vision alive and hear more each time that I can describe in these paintings. So this is the Five Senses box. And what you receive is um, a series of objects that correspond to each of the senses, including the emotional, so the reflective. It works almost like a gift box, so something in between a board game and a gift box, but that's art, right? ourselves and hopefully other people back in tune with their own aspirations, dreams, individualities, and as well as a collective consciousness. What do we have in common? And I think the senses are an incredible place to start with that. quarantine, I have also discovered a sense of awe for the natural world to the, expen uh, to the extent that I've spent an increasing amount of time on trails and in forests and attempting to grow my own foods. My culinary experiments have taken on an exponential form where I've started brewing and canning and making my own broths as well as three course meals. Similar to when I was starting out as a do everything yourselfer, I have now become a from scratch queen. My balcony harvest was adorable this year. I grew banana peppers, cucumbers, potatoes, and tomatoes and kale from the seed. All of these vegetables could fit in the palm of my hand. They were so tiny, but the sheer experience of growing plants, watching them adapt and make decisions and develop fruits brought me an incredible insight into the world beyond the human mind that I had never experienced before. I managed a few small, very small salads with my harvest, but the life lesson from living with plants will stay with me much longer than the nutrients I ate. It takes months to grow any of these tiny vegetables. But this did not start with the quarantine. My interest in sustainability and tactile experience began back when I was a teenager. The constant challenge and need for waste minimization has been a driving force since I can remember. And a few years ago, I began combining a practice in fashion and costume design with naturally dyed materials using wasted food. This topic, which was the first workshop I taught at the SMFA HSS Day, brings together two very important practices for me, the culinary and the tactile. I include the EPA's food recovery pyramid here to open this question for each of you as well. How can you follow every aspect of the food you consume so it does not land in a landfill? Jonas and I now eat all fresh, local, and otherwise wasted ingredients and turn our excess into pickles or drinks for later use. Some things we have been exploring have been making uh, homemade apple wines and delicious pies, and I have been exploring culinary traditions from all over the world. Being at home and quarantining has actually meant a greater opportunity um, to dig into my interests and not compromise on sourcing like I had for convenience before. We are now eating healthier, tastier, homemade organic foods for a fraction of the price that we were paying before for more cons conspicuous to-go options. When I was teaching sewing classes and had started my clothing brand Neshka in Berlin, I tried to teach my students about quality cloths and where to find them. Even the clothes we wear can have a very toxic trail. And my conclusion in the meantime has been to study and learn 
from practitioners who sustainably live within their environments to create their colors. By exploring making my own art materials and educating others on how to make their own as well, I have had the opportunity to promote these topics for sustainable material sourcing and fair trade small producer support. And as it turns out, you can make all sorts of colors straight from your kitchen. These materials that are thrown away like pits and skins and coffee grounds are hidden gold for an artist's practice. Now, I'm expanding these interests into a book about the culinary and artistic uses of many common materials. Skipped one. Here is an example of homemade ink from black walnut, which is an invasive species in this region. It is relatively volatile and has chemicals in its shell that make it more difficult for other plants to grow, which is why I have no hesitations foraging for these in my local park. Um, even when the shells are green, they will still create an incredibly deep brown dye or ink. Once they are boiled down, I add cloves to the mix and paint with them from there. Recently, I have been running some experiments on how it interacts with acrylic paint and different amounts of water. In the end, creating circular systems comes down to an important notion of choosing necessity instead of greed. I envision art practices as becoming no longer wasteful, but waste reduction oriented. Art meets at this incredible intersection of social conscience, expressivity, and awareness. But often, it is the very materials that we use that are ignored. Just like Quincy Quarry, which has been beautifully taken over by people's expressivity, this granite mountain has been given this form by people who took its rock and repurposed it into buildings. But now it is a giant canvas and playground. People are everywhere. And when I see this, I see a story of growth and depletion and voices that are begging to be heard, both human and natural. Sometimes this work involves imagining a world that has adapted to the changing climate, like how could Cambridge Mass look like when it floods? How can we adapt our living spaces to be more self-reliant in the face of flooded zones? One solution might be to secure the bottom floors of the building to be underwater and create new elevated pathways to get to place to place while creating urban gardening opportunities on roofs and balconies. So whether it is creating original fashions like this vest that Javi wore and teaching people a necessary and practical skill like sewing and design or envisioning a system of drought diverted agricultural practices in the face of climate change, sustainable artistic practices can take many forms. I know questions of artistic entrepreneurship and circular systems have done so, done so throughout my career, but no matter what medium you choose, it is the intention and the attention you take to questions of environment, community, and economy that allow a practice to become sustainable and resilient. Many artists are using their work to shed awareness on issues of waste, like Mary Mattingly, who carried all of her waste with her everywhere she went, or Guerra, Guerra de la Paz, who created installations from clothes that had been thrown away. And sometimes sustainability means standing up for your rights, like these France protesting actors who had their benefits cut and refused to play. So whether it is educating others about more sustainable processes and shedding light on what is creating these problems or actively trying to develop solutions to the consequences of climate change, or even spending time deeply listening, observing, and sharing awe striking experiences with each other, there are many approaches, and all of them are relevant. This is a quote from a Michael Pollan documentary of his recent book called Cooked. In it, an interview, he says, You can have cookies, pie, and ice cream all today if you want, but you have to make them yourself. The point is that if you have to make everything yourself, you are unlikely to have all of those things in one day. I want to extend that to an act of practice. There is an incredible challenge to have whatever you want, but realizing that you have to make it yourself. This can apply to dessert, which I am a huge fan of, but also to lasting change. If you want the world to look differently, you can begin making that change through observation, reflection, goal setting, and expression, but be patient. By continually working towards these goals, you are creating a foundation onto which that dream can become a reality in the future. So when I consider my own journey as an artist, it becomes clear that everything began with observation and reflection, then action and reaction. 
It is a constant process and flow of these elements that create a sustained practice. Now, more than ever, the world seems to be screaming for constructive change, and it is up to each of us to listen. In Ralph, Wal Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay on self-reliance, he says to insist on yourself, never imitate. And if I can give any advice, this would be it. Listen to yourself and the world around you and make the world you want to see. And remember, it is the community that surrounds you that is the real audience. Gifting to others is one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself. In the end, if more practices of any kind held gifting and community at the forefront, we would all make more sustainable decisions. So if you have a chance this evening to come to my presentation, I am a finalist in the Green Fund here at Tufts University with a project to develop a green certification of the practice in the arts for the SMFA. This would be, in, be to outline criteria for circular systems program for artists, similar to LEED certified buildings. <laughs> the green certification of the practice in the arts We'll approach, we'll approach the artist practice to support a more socially, environmentally, economically, and educational creative consciousness. Thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions and feel free to contact me at oachallstein at gmail.com or check out my work at one of these websites. Many thanks. Thank you, Olivia, for such an uplifting talk to, to end the semester. Um, should we stop again so people can see your face? Mm -hmm. okay. Oh. Hi there. Oh, no. We have the green. You... The green. Oh, it's green again. Uh, so maybe we can go back to sharing because they're okay. really small, but in your natural <laughs> color. Um, in the meantime, so we have a question here in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, it's from another fellow painter. Oh, great. And he's wondering, uh, well, I think it's he, his name is Taylor Black. Mm -hmm. He says, is, he's currently researching, oh, I'm so sorry, it's a she. Mm -hmm. uh, she's currently researching synthetic dye use in the textile industry mm -hmm. to, to see how to make dyes more sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and she's wondering about the, the, the tension between more using more natural dyes at the expense of land use and natural mm -hmm. depletion. Right. So, what is what are your thoughts on on this trade off? So, I think I, the major issue with synthetic dyes isn't necessarily that the end product is more toxic, because in the end, you know, the, through wastewater, um, synthetics do pollute. Um, pollute fresh water, the actual, you know, often the synthetic version can actually be less toxic than a natural dye. It depending, it all depends on the plant. Um, you, you know, for example, the black oak that I showed, right, it's highly volatile. It really, like, you should not ingest that, right? It's, it's best as an ink rather than a dye to dye cloths. Um, so it's, it's fairly complicated. If, um, I do think that when it comes to dyes and on an industrial level, it's a waste management issue um, larger than uh, it is an actual dye issue. Some synthetics are made from petrol, which is um, problematic. Uh, natural dyes, again, yes, because of land use, um, but it, it also depends on the farming practices. If, you're, if you have a sustainable, um, you know, if you have more of like a permaculture dye garden, on a smaller scale. And um, that's why I, I really support these small scale dyers and, and creators, because if it's on a smaller scale on a more individual level, um, producing your own, your, own, um, your own materials, then it, it does become kind of more in tune with the larger environment. Uh, monocultures are definitely not something that um, should be supported for, for natural dyes. Um, and, I could I could go on on this, but I think I think that probably answers the question. Thank you. Can you talk a little more about the 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 process of using uh, natural uh, dyes from food? Maybe mm -hmm. talk about how do you do it, and what kind what kind of ingredients are your favorites? Oh, sure, sure. I think um, making natural dyes from foods 
I, I love it as a process of, you know, kind of personal responsibility towards one's own waste. It's a great way to um, reduce things going into the landfill while still promoting, you know, being more self-sufficient as an artist. I think some of my favorites um, in terms of natural dyes, with the least fugitive dyes are definitely things like cochineal, which are actually impregnated beetles that grow on cacti in Central America. And those create a wonderful color, especially um, when you add a little bit of acid to them. But out of the kitchen, I'd say probably turmeric because it's a very, very, um, it's very, very dye fast. Um, and I also like red cabbage because depending on whether you have an, uh, a basic or an acidic environment for that red cabbage. It either turns into a bright pink or a blue. Uh, another good one is uh, onion skins, especially red onion skins, because there's quite a, quite a nice surprise there. Um, the onion skins have lots of tannins, so you don't necessarily need to use a mordant um, to make the dye kind of adhere to the fiber. And uh, on red onion skins uh, actually turn green which is a really wonderful green, um, which is lovely. And I, ironically, you know, most of the plants that you'll find in your environment create um, different tones of yellow and, and tend to be rather fugitive. I, I think one of my favorite things is during fall, um, <laughs> walking around New England and seeing all of these oranges and reds and browns and to the realization that, you know, um, the green isn't actually a pigment inside of those leaves. The, the leaves themselves are pigmented, uh, those tones rather than the, um, yeah, the, the chlorophyll that, that creates the green tone. So, because that's a chemical reaction rather than a pigment reaction. So, yeah. As a, a plant ecologist, I find this fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> Lydia made a beautiful turmeric scarf for me that I still have. Uh, mm. Years ago, it's a beautiful uh, yellow. But speaking of plants, uh, Colin mm -hmm. also has a plant questions. Mm -hmm. um, he said he loved the image of learning from plants, and uh, which is why he calls himself a plant behavioral ecologist. Mm -hmm. So he's wondering if there are any ways you could extend that analogy of plants to the community. To the community. Well, I do. I, I mentioned the botanical mind. Um, with being sessile, I do think that I do equate the kind of the quarantine, at the lockdown um, is creating people, making people sessile. Um, and what I, what I didn't realize prior to the quarantine and really, you know, growing, having the time being home, growing my own plants is that, you know, plants make decisions. <laughs> like they make decisions, they adapt, they regrow, they, it's, I had these two cucumber plants and I had to transplant them because there was, I didn't, they didn't re receive enough water for about a week. And they're both on the verge of, of dying. And one of the plants decided that it, um, that it would grow at the top, right? It would just, ex it would kill off all the leaves around the bottom and then grow around or um, grow more on the top of its plant. And the other one actually killed off most of its upper stem and then grew off the bottom. And the second one was slower, but also produced fruit. The first one was able to um, grow from that. This is not surprising for someone who, who studies plant behavior, but uh, I do think, you know, if, if something like, if we're taking or, or if this is goes unacknowledged that plants themselves are decision makers and adapt or expressing adaptable behavior, then, and this is something that we depend on just to provide nutrients for ourselves, right? Like this is something we are completely intertwined with. Um, what else are we overlooking amongst other people and and cultures? I brought up, you know, um, the ikachal by that Frida Kahlo wore that was from Oaxaca and so many practitioners of the arts around the world are not considered in art history aren't considered in that in the modernist perspective of what uh, what has been revolutionary because they're they um, especially indigenous practices are often seen as natural history as literally part of nature rather than part of human civilization and growth and that is 
deeply problematic in how we define uh, how we define peoples and and their contributions. So uh, I think that would be a response to that. Thank you. So we have a, another question about mm -hmm. Cecil. Um, so uh, Fatima asks, can you share more um, about uh, the response that you received from the artists and the community that uh, about your five senses boxes? Mm -hmm. Sure. I think um, there were there were some really heartfelt responses. Um, many many of the people who received them, you know, especially the first variations, have, have only really gone out to um, close knit members of of my community, and there was this real sense of of, of ex gaining an experience that's that that brought them out of the norm. And into a different headspace, you know, the, the similar kind of a kind of feeling to traveling, or, you know, a, a one person equated it to um, the relationship with their mother. There was, you know, certain objects, certain smells, certain um, speech patterns that were in the audio that um, brought them to think about and consider their relationship um, with with that person with that person who was so close to them. And I think that it's especially when these senses are combined, when these multisensorial experiences are developed, there's more potential to tap into that emotional um, realm, right? Where there's there's the potential to to create, on the one hand, a novel experience, you know, where it's literally out of the box, right? Or um, or something that can be become very very personal because, you know, as much as I can curate an experience, um, there's people are individual and have unique experiences that coming into the multisensorial experience, and so they gain different um, the stimuli create different associations in their minds. What I can, what I can kind of what I'm working towards is this feeling of harmony, like this feeling of awe in um, that's really like you have a series of objects that in association do create a kind of a, like an acoustic virtual world, you know, that do create almost like a virtual reality that is acoustic, that is, you know, tactile. Um, so that it, it really does break with the day-to-day -day and offers uh, some refuge, but also, I want to work towards um, creating experiences that that promote empathy and often, you know, maybe put people into the shoes of of each other um, and create more more connection and understanding for one another through that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Will. He is complimenting you on your uh, end products uh, of the mix of music and uh, visual paintings. Thanks. So he would like to know more about the process process of turning uh, audio into visual art. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was working off of recorded audio, right, which was nice because I'm not um, I'm not a synesthete, and I, I that often it comes up in my practice. Synesthesia is when um, people literally see. Um, see colors or symbols when they hear music or when they taste something. And sometimes that can be like associations with like what, what color does a letter have? What color does a number have, et cetera. I do not have that skill. So I have literally developed a methodology um, from practice. So it started with a notebook <laughs> where I, um, whenever I had a free moment, I would listen, I would practice kind of this meditation, listening, drawing and acting as a recorder and seeing what symbols reflected what I was hearing, what was in my, in my aural world. Um, and I would try to isolate certain sounds like the bicycle, like a bicycle wheel turning or, um, you know, the, a car whizzing by or an airplane whizzing by or a dog barking and see, okay, what, what symbols reflect that for me? And there was this breakthrough moment when friends of mine sat at the piano and started actually trying to compose off of the, 
those drawings, which, you know, admittedly looked a little bit like, like scribbles, <laughs> organized scribbling. And, um, and it, it, they sat down at the, at the, um, at the piano and, and played what they, the, the line, the marks that they were seeing. Um, and the sounds actually turned out relatively similar. So I actually started working with musicians, Jonas, and then uh, a colleague of mine in San Francisco who started um, composing off of those drawings. And though there was a lot of difference, very, a lot, quite a bit of variety, there was also um, certain tones, atmospheres that stayed the same um, with these lines. So then I, I combined it with you know, at the at the time, I was also doing quite a bit of animation and drawing using the scanner, um, which was also in itself kind of a a rhythmic exercise. So, in order to draw with the scanner, I used um, either materials or or collages that I had, and I would move it at certain rhythms to get certain patterns. Um, and that aesthetic. I translated it into a painted aesthetic that then I applied to um, to the musical compositions, the recordings that Jonas um, Jonas gave me um, from his work as Aqua Duo. And uh, but again, I'm not a synesthete, so that process was literally hours, arduous hours of listening to the same tracks on repeat uh, and trying to see what associations, what color associations, what felt right, what seemed right, how other people read uh, read those colors, if it matched, et cetera. And that in itself is, has been a training um, to then move now into tastes and flavors and start associating, you know, mark making and then colors and forms um, alongside, you know, theory that I study to um, create those harmonies also with tastes and flavors. Um, so once the pandemic is over, hopefully we'll be able to exhibit those works as well. Thank you, Lydia. That would be awesome. In fact, I remember when we discussed during this talk, we had thought about doing an interactive workshop. Uh, yes. It would have been so nice, so maybe something to revisit in the future. Definitely. And in fact, there is a question about that in the chat, but we ran out of time. So I encourage the questioner to send you an email, which mm -hmm. is on the screen right now. So. Yes. Uh, thank you, Olivia, for being with us today. Thank uh, you for having me. In the rest of the pandemia, pandemic. And we'll be in touch. And for the rest, I'll see you, everyone. Our first lecture is on February 4th. So stay tuned. Bye. Bye, everybody.